Look at that poor little valve. Already gotten so hot. And this one, it's actually uh, deposited a lot of material on that glass there. See if the heaters are still intact. Huh, yep. Yep. Check the other two that look better. Not great, but um, you can tell that these two are on one side, so I'd say probably at a guess this one failed first. Possibly because of that broken grid connection. You can see how discolored the, uh, the anode is in there too. And um, around that area, it's darkened. You can see up, up the top, um, it's lost its plating. I forget the name of that thing. A little, <laughs> little roof chucha, I don't know. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that one's probably failed, then it's taken this one out, because they were on one side supplied by the same bias feed resistor. And then, because the whole bias supply's got dragged down, it's made these start to go as well, but it's uh, it's been switched off before. They've gotten too damaged, I still wouldn't be trusting those two though. You can see the logo there, how white and chalky it's gone. I'll check the heaters on these two just for shits and giggles. Yeah. So all the heaters are intact. <laughs> Be interesting to fire one up in a test jig and just see what happens. If it actually conducts at all or if it's a dead short. So anyway, enough stuffing around. Get some alcohol on this uh, flux. I'll let it soak for a little bit before scrubbing the flux away. 99.997% out of uh, isopropyl alcohol. Right. Shut up, compressor. Thank you. So now we've got some nice shiny little solder connections, nice happy little solder connections to all the pins on the output valves with leaded solder, the old 6040. Uh, so we're ready, oh, push that resistor over. So we're ready to reinstall. Let's go for it. All right, the board's back in its his house. Uh, gonna use the 6.3 amp time delay fuses off the old board did test them and we're ready to throw that back in the chassis and start wiring her up and start some testing and play some music and do things and stuff but before we do that let's have a look at the underside of the existing PCB assemblies and straight away there's a little bit of horror I'll run you through it, but then I'll zoom in and uh, show you as best to the camera's ability. We've got some dry solder joints on the effects loop return jack, which is one of those sort of fender style molded plastic pieces of shit. Um, we've got what looks like contamination on the board and it looks like there has been conduction between those points. So I'm going to have to find out what they are because it looks like there's a bit of a burn spot between them. So there's been some electrolysis has happened there, if you want to get technical. And it looks like there's possibly some conductive board issues there. And that is a connector that goes to the front board. I've got to see if it's got HT on it. Having said that, electrolysis can happen at low voltage as well. Uh, surprisingly low voltage. If you've ever seen Lewis Rossman's channel with MacBook repairs, you're talking 3.3 volts. And serious shit goes down with a little bit of moisture and uh, and uh, some contamination at 3.3 volts. So there's some heat damage here and some dry solder joints there from them melting their own connections. So I'll look at what they are on the other side. Just feels like a couple of resistors that may have been a fault um, that may have been caused by. Hang on, yeah, they're resistors. Flip it over in a minute, have a look, and then pull out the schematic. 
Uh, we've got some uh, dry solder joints there, and that is feeling around two power resistors. We've got some more contamination crustiness here, and that is a connector. We've got cracked solder joints there, and that is the impedance switch. Someone has come in here before and scratched between two pads. Uh, possibly the factory. We've got the beginnings of cracked solder joints and contamination from spillage around the speaker jacks. We've got a little corrosion underneath the solder mask in that area as well. So we'll see what we can see on the front PCB. Oh, that rhymes. <laughs> and not a lot. Uh, in for a penny, in for a pound, eh? I reckon we pull all the boards and do some rework to them and uh, just, just check them for our peace of mind. It sucks taking all the knobs off, but hey, at least it's not a mess of boogie. <laughs> so the missus has gone to netball and here's me pulling off knobs. If only she knew. Got me two spoony trick. No knifey spoony, just spoony spoony. Careful not to uh, affect the front panel. Some of them are just coming straight off. We'll do that, it's easier. The first few were a bit stiff. Stiff knobs. So, uh, we want a 15, we'll see if it's finger tight. Yeah, it's finger tight. It's one of the old school plastic jacks for the input. You know, cliff style. Cliff Burton style. Uh, we'll go a, what is it? I'm guessing 11 mil for the pots. Oh, it's already got a socket on it. 11 mil, come on. Yeah, oh, that was so loose. Let's just do it finger tight, look. Yeah. Jesus, don't they have wheat bix in the UK? Like that's not even like uh, look. Let's open channel A. That oh, made a lot of me. <laughs> I knew that would happen. Volume ultra gain. Oh, no, I'm too weak. Oh, I got the gain. Just finger tight on the nut. So yeah, don't, don't even need a socket. That's pretty piss weak. So they're probably cracked as a result as well. See movement there. Those boards aren't uh, mounted to anything. They're just floating from the pots. And yeah, sure, they've got the little reinforcement bracket on the pot body, but it does fuck all, mate. Um, every amp you see that has that design, budget cuts, budget cuts, they put the bloody accountants in charge again when they should have been out the back sweeping the floor of a real amp company um, whenever they rely on the pots for mechanical strength of a circuit board almost invariably this cracks on those solder joints so let's see yeah there's a couple but it's not it's not as bad as expected probably because it's leaded solder on these ones and some cracks starting to develop on the input jack. So yeah, good thing we pulled it. But of course we pulled it because it's the bloody input jack. So I'll clean them up. As for the rear board, we'll, uh, we'll clean up those areas with the heat and go from there. Just remove the foot switch jack nuts. So instead of relying on pots for uh, mechanical support of this board, it's relying on the jacks. The speaker jacks. You know, the uh, the ones that if they lose their connection, you get a flyback event? Those ones. 9 16 socket for the effects send and return. There those Jalco. As I said, plastic pieces of shit. <laughs> hey, they've lasted this long, eh? I'll stop being cynical. Um, these have some clips, some uh, cable ties to the chassis. 
just remove that one because that seems to be putting up a bit of a fight. And then she swings up. Sweet, that's what we want. Now they are tethered to the front board, but we've written down we've written down what goes from the main board to the front board, but we haven't written down what goes from board to board. Because I was hoping to not do this. <laughs> so we might just uh, do a little bit of a reach around here and have a look. Have a look, have a look, have a look. All right, so I'll put it on the target, on the bench, and we'll zoom in. So you can see there, that contamination is a little pool around that thing. Chalky sort of crap. And there's a big, there's a big sort of dark patch in between those two pins. So we'll get some alcohol, clean that up and just I've got a feeling though that's going to be that's going to present issues. So we'll see what they actually do. I think it's all low voltage stuff back here, but I might be wrong. Stranger things have happened. Oh, and these uh, these two here, they weren't resistors. I felt them from the other side and assumed they're resistors. They're xenodiodes. So once again, we have a manufacturer refusing to admit that linear regulators exist. So they're using center diodes in a, what was, I don't know, what were these things worth new? Two grand? Linear regulators aren't that expensive. Anyway. So yeah, ZD, um, ZD, well ZD for you Yanks, make you feel at home. ZD1 and 2 have overheated and they've got 270 ohm resistors regulating. Oh, you can't see shit. Sorry. They've got two, uh, five... Uh, what resistors regulating and then filter caps those two diodes there up against the caps almost like they planned for those caps to fail and those two those four caps hugging these two five watt resistors almost like they're trying to heat them up there's plenty of room here they could have spread stuff out but you know there's other options and stuff I think they use the same board for the TSL I believe uh, and it's just got some parts that aren't populated for the DSL. It looks like a DI section over to the left there. It's got an XLR blank spot. Um, so yeah, this, this same layout of circuit board used for different models according to what's populated and what's not. So one thing at a time, we'll replace these Zenners uh, with some new ones just to get their leads longer. We'll lift them off the board a bit and crimp their leads, maybe bend them over a little bit away from those uh, caps, but obviously we don't want them to short out on each other. We'll have a close look at these crusty solder connections here and over out of, out of frame over here. Uh, that's another connector. And go from there. So anyway, let's stop talking and bloody do something. Just in analysis paralysis once again. Okay, so it's not looking too bad. It looks like maybe just the, the crusty crap on top had burned or just gone super crusty. Yeah, circuit board's looking actually pretty, pretty schmicko between those two pins, so no problem there. I'll just continue cleaning. Have a look at this one. This one looks a bit more dramatic. The solder goes like crusty and like gray when it's overheated. Yeah, that one's come good too. Thanks dog for that. Oh, I'm blowing it, I've got a compressor right here. <laughs> yeah, I think that'll be good. Uh, I'll reflow those solder joints or clean them off and re Reflow them though, because they look pretty corroded. Here's that solder joint, where you can pass your probe through to the other side of the board. So yeah, we'll just we'll clean this one up, stick it back in, and then we'll have another close look at the uh, preamp one that looks pretty good, or the, the front front panel control PCB that looks good, ish. So they are BZY97C15. So 15, I guess, is the voltage plus minus 15 volts. That makes sense. We'll double check the schematic. But I've got uh, 
5 watt versions of them in stock they look like 1 watt maybe 2 watt I'll look up data sheet but yeah I've got 5 watt ones and their, their bodies are significantly bigger so they can dissipate more heat so I'll probably put some 5 watters in there regardless and those leads will still bend down within that pad to pad distance these resistors look a bit crusty too so I'll clean them up everything's crusty on these, these things but this is all factory stuff. This would have been crusty from the factory. Just put a, a bit of a kink in those leads too. I just want to make it like Just reflow these uh, solder joints to the impedance selector switch, which is a bit flimsy way of doing it, to be honest. Some connections you just, it's not really worthwhile having them on the board because then they go from like the transformer to to the output jack. It's like, why don't you just, just chuck in the labor just to buy that, just those connections, you know? All right, so here's the three speaker jacks. We've got the four or eight ohms, they're paralleled. You can see that that's the, that's the tip, that's the tip, that's the normal, I guess you call it, that, you know, the one that the tip closes against when nothing's plugged in. So all of them are connected together. That one's the normal of the ring, so, uh, the sleeve, sorry, so the ground. So that's not required. Um, but all of these are parallel together. Now that's your, that's your ground for your speaker. That's your current return coming back from your speaker. Um, here's the switch that selects between your two impedances for these two parallel outputs, four and eight ohm. And then here's your 16 ohm uh, output. So this one here is the actual sleeve connection. And that's the ground coming back from the power, uh, the output transformer secondary. And that's got to go through the contacts of the jack in order for the ground to make it to the 8 and the 4 ohms. Uh, so if that jack fails, you've got it's like unplugging your speaker. You've got no load on the output. And it can destroy shit. And it... Quite possibly did in this situation, we don't know. Uh, no way to know for sure. I could test it now, but it'll probably test fine. Um, but it could have been intermittent. So what we have to do is link this and this lead together. Ideally, we just bypass the circuit board, just put a big friggin' bus wire across the whole lot. So uh, that way it gives it a bit of reinforcement as well. And then this here is the 16 mil tip. So that's fine. That's only ever going to go to the tip of this jack. So we're not worried about that one. That's fine. That's the actual tip connection, not the normal connection. When I say normally, I'm talking about the contact that the tip closes against when there's no jack plugged in. And we've got three happy little speaker output jacks. Moving on. All right, so this schematic's a bit shit. Uh, a bit blurry, but you get the idea. It's two 15 volt zeners in the usual configuration with a dropper resistor to form a bottom basement budget uh, regulated plus minus 15 volt supply with a lot of wasted energy uh, turned into heat. So, yay! That's our two diodes there 15 volt BZY97C. BZY97C. Uh, so I'll just check the power rating on them just, just for shits and giggles. Alright, so here it is. Uh, voltage 10 to 200 volt depending on the model and power 1.5 watt. Now it is true that you don't want to run a Zener at like 1 20th of its rated current. Because um, it will go out of regulation. There is a curve and generally you're safe if you spec it to like, you know, 50 or above percent of its rating. Uh, in this case, we'll chuck it in. Instead of calculating the bloody uh, current draw of the whole circuit or whatever, we'll just chuck it in, empirically measure it, just check that the voltage uh, rails are within tolerance and go from there. If, uh, if they're going out, then we can put a lower rating in there. Holy hell, look at this. Almost finished my uh, roller solder. I think I only got that a few months ago. <laughs> Goes to show... Uh, what life around here has been like. 
All right, what would a Brad's guitar garage repair be without ripping pretty much everything out? <laughs> but anyway, we're good now, so we'll go back in. We'll get them in situ. Oh, I like this song. So we'll get this thing back together, and then we'll go through our usual procedure of checking voltages prior to giving it the full mains and checking all of the pins of the valves, checking that everything on every header, every test point should be what we expect. I had a run in with another tech, not too long tech, not too long ago, um, and he's like. Oh, I, I can't be expected to test every voltage and check all of that and document it and write it on the invoice. That's ridiculous. Nobody does that. Well, yeah, fucking everyone does that. So, sorry, buddy. That's what you should be doing. I don't know what you're doing with that time you're charging, but anyway. <laughs> you run your business how you like, mate. Hopefully it doesn't bite you in the ass. So, anyway, we'll uh, put this back in. So for cleaning the pots, I've got this stuff here, the Electrolube EML. It's a lubricant as well as cleaner, and cleaner as well as lubricant. I just like the little cans. They're nice and maneuverable. It's not the big stupid cans some of the brands have, or the stupid, stupid fold-out tips they got on the um, deoxid stuff. Like, who designs those things? Surely whoever designs them has never used one. We don't want to get it everywhere, just a little bit in those switches too. If we can avoid it from getting onto the actual board, that's about the right amount. You see some ants that come in with this greasy shit all over the board and it's run, you can see it's run down from every pot where they've just... <laughs> so just work the pots back and forth after uh, giving them a bit of that treatment. Just so it spreads it around. Well, Give it a proper working when it's in place and we're not doing the backwards double dutch right to reach around on the uh, wrong side of the bench because of uh, poor video planning, essentially. <laughs> I ain't no Steven Spielberg. More um, Oliver Stone, I think. <laughs> we'll just give those jacks. Well, we've got the uh, chassis oriented this way. Give the jacks a bit of the old in-out, in-out. Give them a clean, give them a pipe cleaner. I've never cleaned a pipe with it. It's false advertising. A bit of alcohol on the end there. Looking like those effects jacks have never been used their whole life. Spun it back around. We'll start installing these pot nuts. A little bit tighter than last time, maybe. You can't go too tight with these things. Because it's that shitty pot metal. And when I say pot metal, it's nothing to do with the fact that it's on a pot. Ah, I know, it's confusing. Um, pot metal is like low quality cast metal, aluminium. It's, I don't know why they call it pot metal. Maybe because uh, it's whatever they pulled out of the pot. I don't know. It's recycled. I don't know. But yeah, it's called pot metal. It's these... Uh, Almost zinc looking. Oh, it could be a zinc. Yeah. Zinc's what I call every metal and I don't know what it is. Yeah, that's zinc. <laughs> it's um, sort of got that grey sort of weird non-shiny colour to it. The better pots, like on the vintage Marshalls, were machine brass. But shit, I can't can afford that these days. Burns and CTS. That's it. So just a quick look at these uh, cheapo PCB mounted pots that Marshall love. Uh, they've got like a square shaft. Well, it's not square, but it's got truncated top, bottom, left, and right on a round shaft. So it's got flat spots there. Now, they punch a square hole in the chassis, so you don't need a lock nut, or theoretically don't need a lock nut on the inside because the pot's travel is limited by the rotational allowance of its clearance in that square hole but as you can see that's quite a bit now if i twisted that that'd probably go like a degree or two before it got jammed up in that hole so that's enough to crack the solder joint so it sort of defeats the purpose but it is what it is it's marshall mate multinational corporation who am i to tell them not to put a round peg in a square hole some dickhead in his garage
Not really. I've got a shop now. <laughs> so where was I? Point being, uh, it's hard to get the nuts on the, the pot bushing straight and get them to thread on nicely. So you've got to really be careful when you're threading it on that it's actually taking to the thread. Uh, a lot of amps that people have been to before me, the pots are all cross-threaded because of these weird square bushings on them. And they've destroyed them. The pot's fine, but they've they've either stripped the thread or r ripped the bushing off it or stripped the nut or it's jammed on there. So yeah, that if you know what you're looking at and you know how to deal with it, it's fine. But a lot of guys, that, oh, it's just a nut and they thread it on and get stiff. So what do they do? They just tighten it up. <laughs> nothing, nothing tighter than stripped, am I right? So tightening these up, we don't want to give them too much, so just on the screwdriver, don't get your wrist on it. Just how much torque you can offer with, say, two two or three fingers is about right, but, you know, not, not so loose. They're almost going to come off by themselves like when it came in. Now, this isn't meant to be an instructional channel, but I keep talking to you like you're doing it. Um, I don't know why I do that. I guess because there's a lot of people out there that do it wrong. And if they're watching, maybe through osmosis, a little, little bit of stuff might sink in and they'll stop destroying shit. Because uh, I'd really like that. I, you know, I don't revel in seeing other techs do horrible shit to amps because the amps eventually end up here and I have to deal with it and the customer's unhappy. So, you know, anything you can glean from this. Or, again, I don't know. Fuck all in the scheme of things. So if you can... Uh, enlighten me on a better way to do something that I'm doing let me know you know who you are <laughs> right as usual we'll get a vacuum out do a bit of cleaning to this thing because it's looking pretty corroded Alrighty, so we got rid of uh, all the, the loose crap. We'll stick this board back in. Put the ground, star ground connection up the preamp end. And the yeah, output valves up the power end. Yes, they're output valves, not power valves. They don't give you power. They dissipate power. <laughs> Right, so here's these things that Marshall like to use. They're molded little grommets with a, a cut in them. And they're put there inside the, uh, the metal there on the edge. Probably a few reasons, I guess, to protect that sharp surface or protect your finger from that sharp surface. Make it less likely that your finger's going to go down and touch those pins in there, which will have high voltage on them. It's not the best design, really, is it? You could easily pull a valve out. You're reaching around giving it a reach around and you reach in, you got bloody 300 volts or something on your finger. <laughs> you wake up pretty quick. But um, they often get all, uh, you know, turned to, turn to dust. But uh, these ones are still okay, so we'll reuse them. The first one has a shield, like I was showing on some of the other recent marshals. That goes in there. The spring against the top of the valve keeps it tensioned against the chassis and sort of kind of sort of makes contact and hopefully gives some form of some degree of shielding and they've they come with a little o-ring on them which goes around under that lip under that uh thing ridge that's what i'm looking for and uh hopefully stops any vibrations that you might hear through the amp but yeah, I've found they generally don't rattle anyway, and that, that O-ring's basically just for show. It does bugger all once the thing's pushed up by the spring. It's not really touching anything anyway. But yeah, they just crumble away to nothing when you remove them, so. Well, it's almost starting to look like an amp again. I might leave this one here for the night. I'm getting hungry, man. I'm gonna go home, and tomorrow we'll fire it up, give it a test, give it a play with my new little interface. Look, this just turned up. I 
was talking last time about getting a new interface. It's got this little cheapy, just Mo2. I like Mo2 stuff. M2. Just got your two inputs there. I like this one because all the inputs are on the front and the outputs are on the back. So that can go up to the stereo or to the, you know, um, speakers. And USB-C, which I'll just pop up to the laptop here through a little cable hole. And I'll mount it under the bench. Haven't decided over here. Might be in the way of the soldering lines over there. Might be in the way of something else. I'll figure it out. And um, that way I'm always ready to record. And I might even, the audio is pretty good with this mic, but I might even in the future um, get some kind of headset mic just to make it a bit clearer. Especially when this background noise of me testing an amp or something. New toys, they're always fun.